The changing behavior of consumers has had many industries reevaluating their business models and examining how they can more effectively compete against new entrants and existing companies. At the core of these changes are millennials. We believe their traits are causing lasting shifts in almost every industry, from media to healthcare, apparel to grocery, mobility to lodging, and many more. In this episode of The Pulse, we'll discuss how millennials are shifting the balance of power, how their traits are impacting investment decisions today and for tomorrow. Hi, everyone. It's Matt Palazzolo, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Senior Portfolio Manager, Paul Robertson, for our discussion of millennials and their impact on industries today. Welcome to the show, Paul. Pleasure to be here, Matt. I guess I should have said welcome back. It wasn't it earlier this year that you and I were discussing Bitcoin and blockchain? Indeed it was, yes. Yeah, I enjoyed those podcasts with you. Uh, and for any of our listeners out there that haven't yet heard those episodes, please go back and check out our library. Because now knowing where Bitcoin and blockchain have evolved to today, it's interesting to hear our perspectives then, certainly given how fluid the environment has been. But let's get to our topic today, Paul, uh, which is millennials. We've been hearing for years how millennials are different from prior generations. I'm Gen X, and so I certainly feel the difference. Many of us, myself included, experience these differences firsthand, whether it's how we communicate with them, how they communicate with each other, how they spend their free time, what they value, the list goes on and on. So why is it so important to understand millennials' habits and their behaviors and their preferences? Well, Matt, we are, of course, investment managers on behalf of our clients. And uh, the unique habits, behaviors, and values of millennials are impacting businesses. They are impacting demand. When I say demand, I mean what millennials buy how they buy it, where they buy it. Whether it's goods or services, millennials are impacting demand, which in turn affects company revenues. Interestingly, their characteristics, their habits, their behaviors, their values are no longer uniquely theirs. They have been influences for other generations as well. We're all more inclined to demand immediacy and connectivity in our lives today. Millennials' influence is unparalleled, and that means for investment managers who need to understand future cash flows at businesses, we need to first understand how patterns of demand are changing and what it means for future growth. Let's get a little bit more specific here. So why is it that millennials are so influential on the varied industries that I touched on earlier? Well, the first thing to recognize is there are very big generations. There's just a lot of them. There are a lot of them. The the generations typically span about 15 years. Mm -hmm. So millennials were born between 1981 and 1996, which makes them anywhere from 22 to 37 today. Now, in a few years' time, they're likely to be the largest of the generations that we define, larger than Gen X, larger than the baby boomers, way larger than the last generation, which we call the silent generation. So they're soon to be the biggest in terms of sheer numbers. Mm-hmm. And as they move through their, their lives, their incomes are going to become the highest of the generations. So biggest population group, soon to be, and a little bit after that, the group with the largest amount of disposable income. That's why millennials are so influential. So size and spending power certainly makes them influential. But let's delve a little bit deeper into millennials and how their behaviors were shaped. What what influenced them? I've heard you talk a lot about um, how they are a product of their circumstance. What do you mean by that? So This is what generational research is all about. It's the idea that you can draw conclusions about people's values, habits, and behaviors through their lifetime from formative experiences when they were very young. I think we're all aware that people born just before the Great Depression Mm -hmm. were profoundly affected by that experience. Millennials, in many ways, are the mirror image of this. They are the product of affluence. Their parents were the highest educated group of parents we've ever seen before, and they delayed childbearing so that when they did have children, their incomes were significantly higher than their parents' incomes. 
millennials grew up in smaller families. Um, their, their family size was, they had fewer brothers and sisters. And as a result, the enhanced resources of their families were devoted to a smaller group of children. So each child was sort of getting exponentially greater resources devoted to them. And they've always been showered with validation, constant praise. So in these environments of affluence, all the research shows that people take a much slower path to engage in adult activities. If you ask yourself how many millennials of a given age uh, own a home versus prior generations at the same age, or how many millennials have been married uh, at certain age groups versus prior generations, you see all of this slower path to engaging in adult activities. Let me just push back a little bit on this affluence and, and ask you to square the circle on something that's been gnawing at me for some time, and I've heard your research um, often. You say that this generation grew up in an age of affluence, and yet we've talked a lot about, and, and it's been covered in the media, this income dispersion that has occurred over the last number of decades. How is it that the millennials are so affluent when there has been such a large gap between the well-off and the not well-off? So I guess that's the point, Matt. If you look at the averages, millennials are the product of affluence. But if you now look within the generation, not every millennial, of course, was brought up Mm -hmm. in circumstances of affluence. And it's very interesting to see that millennials not brought up in, in affluent families have habits, behaviors, and values that are more like those of prior generations. Mm. So even within the millennial group, you see that affluence or not affluence has had a profound impact on behaviors and values and habits Mm -hmm. of this cohort. I guess as always. So let me now extend these uh, circumstances that you laid out to industries and consumer demand. What's the connection there between the circumstances that the millennials were brought up in generally and, and sectors of the economy? Well, I think the most important thing to to bear in mind is if you're brought up, as the silent generation was, in environments of extreme scarcity, that profoundly affects your attitudes towards spending money and saving. Um, People who came of age during the Great Depression were profoundly affected by that experience, and scarcity was something that concerned them for their entire lives. Millennials, on the other hand, have been brought up in conditions, for the most part, of great affluence. And so they're not worried about scarcity. If you think about um, traditional models of hierarchies of needs, like the Maslow hierarchy, what people are, are said to be primarily concerned with is meeting their basic needs, food, clothing, shelter. And only once those things have been taken care of can they start thinking about higher needs, Now, millennials are just not concerned, for the most part, about meeting those basic needs. Mm -hmm. They've always been amply met Mm -hmm. for most millennials. And despite the recession in 2008, um, their life experience is likely to continue to be one where those basic needs are always amply met. So they value experiences over goods, They're not about conspicuous consumption of goods so much as conspicuous consumption of experiences, which anyone who spends any time on Facebook or Instagram can instantly recognize. But it affects all sorts of industries, not just social media, which really caters for this conspicuous consumption of experience Mm -hmm. idea, but it impacts the travel industry, for example. When they go shopping for even basic goods and services, they're more interested in the experience than the simple acquisition of the goods. Now, in a later session, we might uh, spend some time comparing and contrasting Ulta, a beauty product company, with, say, the beauty counter at Mm -hmm. a Macy's or a Penny's or a Nordstrom's or any of those sorts of stores. I mean, the business models are strikingly different and come down to this insistence on the part of millennials for an experience and a self-guided experience. So not having to worry about scarcity, this, this aspect of affluence has been influential. What else characterized their early days that influences who they are today and what they value? 
Yes. So I think this is equally as important. They came of age during what we could call the information age. Millennials are the first generation to take for granted always being connected with friends and families and work colleagues. Instant answers, right? I often sit with my children. My children are not millennials. They are the next generation, whatever they're going to be called. And if any question that comes up, we either go to Alexa or we go to Google, right? It's very simple. Yes, it it is striking and, and it has profound impacts for all sorts of businesses. It's this expectation of constant connectivity, being able to get what you want when you want it is a key characteristic of millennials. And we see it in the generation that's following. They, they're they the next generation to always take for granted this idea of always being connected. Now, we think about the information age in the same vein as, as other major shifts in the economy, like the Industrial Revolution or technologies like the telephone, or the steam-powered engine, or or television, or many others. This is a dramatic shift in technology and the economy, and millennials take it for granted, and because of that, drive businesses to interact with them in new ways. Let's try and pull this together, at least to this point. Um, Obviously, the environment in which they grew up is different from that of the baby boomers and Gen X and and other generations. That's obvious. And you and your team have developed somewhat of a framework to better understand millennial demand. Walk our listeners through that. Yeah, we spent a lot of time looking at different businesses and different industries and trying to understand what behaviors of millennials were giving rise to these new industries and businesses. And as we tried to condense the data into sort of a usable framework, we really came up with three notable behaviors that we think are driving millennial um, wants. The first is this concept we've just been talking about. It's this expectation of immediacy, of connectivity. The second is a striking openness to sharing personal data, uh, an openness that often strikes older people as really quite unique for millennials. And lastly, it's this desire for experiences. So these three concepts, the expectation of immediacy, the openness to sharing personal data, and the desire for experiences are shaping the way that millennials and and the business world interact. And importantly, we think these traits aren't transient. These aren't things that are going to go away as millennials get older. There may be other characteristics of of young people that go away as they get older. But millennials are likely to carry these behaviors, these expectations uh, with them for the rest of their lives. And as a result, this is causing lasting shifts in almost every industry. And I think to your point earlier that the millennial generation's characteristics have influenced other generations that came before them is important too. So as we think through these three behaviors, again, immediacy, openness to sharing, and the desire for experiences, uh, let's talk about some of the industries that are most affected by them. Sure. Let's start with the obvious one. The obvious one is retail, where the rise of e-commerce really meets this need for immediacy. And we all know that brick-and-mortar retailers have taken enormous hits as expenditure has shifted into the online world and e-commerce. Another Uh, One that people understand is streaming media. Now, when we talk about streaming media, we're talking about the rise of services like Netflix and Hulu. This one particularly um, interests me because I remember when I was a little bit younger and enjoyed watching Seinfeld, Mm -hmm. you'd watch an episode, go to work uh, the next day and talk about it. Uh, It was popular water cooler conversation, if you like. When we still had water coolers. When we still had water coolers, (laughs) that's right. And, you know... A week would go by before you could watch another episode. And my kids will now stream an entire season of The Office or Game of Thrones or whatever. And and I, I used to look at it bemused and slightly bewildered by it. But I have to say I've become a rampant streamer of course, of course myself. You have. Uh, so streaming media is uh, one of these interesting businesses, which is doing terrible damage to the traditional TV business, but 
we also see signs that the traditional media companies are gearing up to respond. Right. Yeah. yeah. Having to flex in light of the success of Netflix and Hulu and these demand necessities driven by and influenced by the millennials. Absolutely. Now, some less obvious categories might be uh, the grocery business, where the millennials desire for fresh foods, uh, but often also for prepared foods is transforming the way grocery stores look. What is it that they say about millennials that they would prefer a meal cooked anywhere but, but in, in their, their own, own home, ki- exactly. but in their own kitchen, <laughs> right. which has been a tremendous boon for the restaurant industry. The, the, the growth in restaurant revenues today is not being driven by more diners in the dining room. It's being driven by takeout and delivery orders. Right. And, and in, U- Uber delivers or whatever that – Uber Eats. Uber and Eats, yeah. Grubhub and all of these businesses are, are, are also doing very well. The suppliers to the restaurant business, the U.S. Foods, the Cisco's – uh, that's not the telecommunications mm-hmm. company. That's S-Y. the food delivery, SYSC Co. That's right. So these companies are all doing very well. But there are other implications. You mentioned Uber, Matt. Um, Uber converts car ownership into a service where it's all about a ride. Uh, so car manufacturers are perhaps facing some severe challenges from the rise of things like apps that allow you to instantly call a car to the corner that you're standing on, or Airbnb is doing tremendous damage to the hotel business. So there's a lot of industries that are either benefiting or under threat from all of this change. Um, We even spent some time looking at the credit card networks, companies like Visa and MasterCard, because we were at least initially interested in what mobile payment applications might mean for those businesses. Interestingly, we realized that in the U.S. at least, it means nothing for Visa and MasterCard Mm. because those payments end up getting processed through the same Visa and MasterCard networks that might be used if you pulled out a plastic card and put the card down as the method of payment. Let me give you one last example that might surprise people. I guess we all appreciate that social media is an outgrowth of the information age and millennials' willingness to share. It's a very new business, so people aren't really thinking about the ramifications on other businesses. But at its core, social media is an ad-funded business model. Now, advertising expenditure in our economy is reasonably constant over time. So what we're witnessing is a massive migration of advertising dollars out of traditional media, things like newspapers, magazines, radio, outdoor advertising, cinema advertising, even TV advertising, although to a lesser extent. We're seeing a massive migration of advertising revenues from those traditional media into an online world and What this is doing is tremendous damage to those traditional media companies. It's a pretty simple example, I guess, of how a new industry can affect existing players in industries that most of us wouldn't automatically think was connected or related in any way to the new industry. But fundamentally, as demand shifts and as revenues shift, these businesses suffer major collateral damage. So it's demand. It's the fact that millennials are more online and on these social networks than they ever were before. But isn't it also because you can quantify the return on your investment for advertising if you put it up on Facebook or something else versus if you just buy a 30-second spot while Seinfeld, for example, is playing? Yes, that is the argument. And and, and, uh, look, I was a media analyst. I think that it's very true that you get a better return on investment in in social media applications. You can micro-target audiences. There's an enormous value in the data created by these social media companies around your habits, preferences, and wants, which allows much more precise targeting uh, of ads and therefore a much higher... Uh, click-through or response rate to that advertising. So all of these shifts are giving rise to all sorts of significant investment controversies that we as wealth managers are going to have to really focus on. And what our research does focus on is, is the idea that what we're experiencing is a profound structural change in the economy. The last 10 years, we've seen very few cyclical controversies. Essentially, the economy has just grown. Mm-hmm. 
But we've seen all sorts of secular shifts in personal behaviors trickling through almost every industry. We, we talked about how social media disrupts traditional media businesses. We've already touched briefly on the idea that some existing companies are well positioned to benefit from these changing behaviors. We talked about the food distribution companies or um, the credit card networks, Visa and MasterCard networks. But many other businesses are really faced with a profound challenge of reinventing themselves in this world or failing. And again, as a media, former media analyst, I'm just endlessly fascinated by what goes on in the media world. The, the alliances that are being formed are really interesting. Uh, AT&T, a telephone company, bought Warner Media. Disney has just brought the TV and movie production assets of Fox. Fox essentially threw up its hands and said, we can't compete. We can't bulk up, get enough scale in this changing world. Comcast owns the Universal Studios TV and film production assets. So these new entities are gearing up, or new combinations are gearing up to compete with the Netflix and Hulus of the world. So we as investment managers are really struck with understanding what the future is going to look like. It- and, I, and I think as I look back on the – and I think back on on those uh, combinations that you laid out in the media industry, they've all happened just in the last few years. And so it just underscores how fluid the environment it is and how the – business leaders at each of those organizations feel how important it is in order to adjust given imperfect information, right? Nobody knows exactly what the future will look like, but to make a move today to either buy or be bought in order to survive. Absolutely. Now, the the challenge we face is one that we've talked a little bit about before when we've discussed disruption with our clients. We've talked about how the initial disruptor in an industry needn't be the eventual winner. And I think we've shared examples about the the cell phone business Mm -hmm. uh, where Palm and um, Research in Motion with its BlackBerry phones or even Nokia stumbled and their leadership in the smartphone space was ultimately assumed by Samsung and Apple. And I don't mean to imply that Samsung and Apple will forever be the the leaders there. When we look at um, streaming media, it's an open question whether or not Netflix and Hulu will still be standing in five or, or ten years' time or whether the new streaming platforms that companies like Disney are soon to bring to market will eventually overtake them. We've spent some time looking at Netflix in detail recently, and what is striking is that the subscriber and revenue growth is matched by an equivalent increase in expenditure on new content. They never get out in front of it. They never turn the corner, at least they haven't yet turned Mm -hmm, the corner, mm -hmm. and generated profitability. I guess we look at Amazon in much the same way. Amazon has transformed the way we buy things, but it's They've yet to demonstrate the kind of returns on invested capital that would allow us to conclude that there is a sustainable business of the current size that Amazon has achieved. It may be that that as they charge higher prices in order to improve the returns on capital, the business shrinks somewhat. So these are the kind of challenges that we're grappling with. Access to cheap capital over the past decade has enabled the spectacular growth of these companies. But as interest rates now go up, who knows? Capital is uh, becoming less and less cheap every single day. Yes, exactly. And in some ways, this is capitalism at its best. It, It raises businesses and it tears them down. It's creative destruction. So the questions we, we struggle with are, can the incumbents generate sustainable business models? Can the people who've been displaced evolve and survive? Can they recognize the need to evolve and soon enough? And once they've recognized the need, do they have the resources to evolve and restore themselves to relevance? These are the kind of questions that we're grappling with. And, and you see some of the results um, flowing through uh, into holdings in our clients' investment portfolios. So, Paul, obviously you pose a lot of really important questions, none of them with straightforward answers. We're going to leave it there, and I want to thank you for joining us today and providing some of your insights on this very important topic of millennials and their influence on business. It's been my pleasure, Matt. And for all of you listening, if you'd like to learn more about this topic of millennials, please see the link to our white paper, Shifting Balance of Power, 
in the episode's description. And please also check out our other series under the Bernstein Insights umbrella, Claire Gala's Inspired Investing and Beata Kerr's Women in Wealth. And finally, as always, if you have any feedback or suggestions for us, please email us at insights at Bernstein.com or find us on Twitter at Bernstein PWM. Bernstein, making money meaningful for individuals, families, and foundations for over 50 years. Visit us at Bernstein.com.